The Triassic was a wild time for the dinosaurs, in large part because that's when their three major groups actually evolved. First you have the Ornithischians, the largely herbivorous kinds that would eventually evolve into things like Triceratops or Stegosaurus. Then you have the Saurischians, which themselves are split into two groups. The theropods, so the largely meat-eating ones, things like Tyrannosaurus rex or Allosaurus. And then finally you have the sauropods, which are, you know, the really big ones like Brachiosaurus or Diplodocus. And that's where the subject of this video comes in. Panty Draco was a pretty small dinosaur, and was one of these early ones from the Triassic. The best fossil we have of it was probably only about a meter long, so around three feet, but even the larger ones still probably only got up to about three meters, or around nine feet. So definitely not anything like the giant relatives of it that would live later, and we will get to those relatives. So what was going on with Panty Draco? Well, the name actually gives us a little bit of a hint as to the kind of place it was found in, because in Welsh, Pantyphenon means spring or well, and it was found in this kind of quarry near springs and wells in southern Wales. And so it very much is a Welsh animal, and everything except for the species name, which comes from Latin. The species name being Caducus. So Panty Draco Caducus. And the thing is that Caducus means fallen, and that's because it was in a fissure fill. So essentially you would have had this kind of rock, this conglomerate that would have already been deposited. You would have gotten some kind of little crack in it, and then it seems like Panty Draco, or at least this specimen of Panty Draco, fell inside of that crack and then got covered by mud, and that follows why it was named Caducus. So that's why it was named what it was, but what was it? What other animals was it related to? Well, one of the two papers that's on this animal specifically actually lists a ton of reasons for it to be aligned with certain groups of fossil animals. It also lists over 140 different characteristics that are unique, or at least the collection of them is unique in Panty Draco to help argue that it is indeed its own kind of species. Now to start, the Ornithischians and the Saurischians are really easy to tell apart, at least some of the time, because the Ornithischians are the bird hip dinosaurs, and Birds are actually Saurischians, but they changed their pelvis shape, and that's important because that's where the name comes from. It's essentially bird hips, and so the bird hip actually has the pubis pointing backwards, something that we don't see in a lot of the theropod dinosaurs or in the sauropods. That's why they're Saurischians, because their pubis goes forward more like a lizard's, so lizard hipped. Unfortunately though, while the fossils of Panty Draco are pretty articulated, meaning most of the bones are in the right place, one of the bones that isn't in the right place is the pubis. So we don't actually know where the pubis pointed because it just eroded away entirely. So there's no pubis, there's none of this kind of hip structure that would tell us just based on that which of these two groups it belonged to. But researchers have found a lot of other things other than just the hips that helped separate the Ornithischians and the Saurischians. One of these is the obturator plate in the ischium, which is something that's only found in the Saurischian dinosaurs. It also had relatively large hands, with the hand length being over 45% of the length of the humerus and the radius, which is basically the entire arm. The humerus is this entire upper arm bone, and then the radius is this lower arm bone, or at least one of the two lower arm bones. And the hand made up 45% of that length. So for humans, it would be basically a hand being as long as this. So it had these very large hands, again, something that we find in Saurischians, but not Ornithischians, which in general had much smaller hands. Now there is one piece of bone that was found with Panty Draco that might actually be that pubis bone that would really help to narrow it down, but this pubis bone looks way too large to be from that specimen of Panty Draco. So it may have been from another dinosaur that just got washed in. But it does also have some of the characteristics that we would expect in a Saurischian dinosaur. So if it is from Panty Draco, great, if not, we still have characteristics that show Panty Draco was a Saurischian. And part of the reason we actually have this kind of good understanding of what Panty Draco was is because we have some very close relatives of it. In fact, some of these relatives are so close, Panty Draco wasn't recognized as Panty Draco, its own genus, when it was first found. Instead, it was called a new species of an already named dinosaur, Thacodontosaurus, which was found in the 1800s, and was about the same size, and also comes from southern England, so it makes sense that this kind of confusion would happen when the fossils were first found. It really took a much more in-depth look to really understand that no, this is something that is a little bit more separate than Thecodontosaurus. And some of the traits we can use to tell this relationship have to do with some of the plate-like projections on some of the neck vertebra, but also a very short head 
and especially the teeth, which have a very classic sauropodomorph shape. And I want to be clear, it's sauropodomorph, not sauropod, because the taxonomy is a little funny, and I'm going to get into exactly what that means as far as its relation to the much larger sauropod dinosaurs, like Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus that I mentioned earlier. Sauropodomorpha is kind of the sauropods and also everything that led up to them eventually. So Pantydraco and also Thicodontosaurus kind of fall outside of the true sauropods or Neosauropoda, where we really think of the really, really large ones. So again, they're very early offshoots of the sauropod group without being actual sauropods. And there are other examples of small sauropodomorphs coming from the Triassic. One of the most famous is Eoraptor, potentially one of the first Sauriscians, and very close to the split between the sauropodomorphs and the theropods. But the skull has some features that seem to align up more with the sauropodomorphs. And it was also very small. But it also lived tens of millions of years before Pantydraco and Thicodontosaurus. But evolution still occurred throughout that time, and those kinds of steps that led up to the neosauropods, those were still happening. Despite the fact that Pantydraco had broken off of that lineage millions of years earlier, there were still large sauropodomorphs around at the same time. For example, you can look at Platyosaurus, which many fossils of it have come from Germany, and it could get up to 9 meters, so it's three times in just the length, not including all of the dimensions, of potentially the largest Pantydraco. So we're talking about an animal many, many times larger. So just saying Pantydraco is an early offshoot of the sauropodomorphs, and that's why it stayed small, doesn't really answer the question, because it very well could have gotten larger if the conditions were right. So what were the conditions that led to Pantydraco and also the fairly small Thicodontosaurus to evolve in parts of the southern Great Britain? The Triassic was bracketed by mass extinctions on both sides. The first at the Permian Triassic wiped out a ton of life on land, and that kind of loss of life on land allowed the survivors, including what would become the dinosaurs, to become wildly successful. And that includes the sauropodomorphs like Pantydraco. But of course, then there was the one at the end, much closer to when Pantydraco lived. And that one happened because of the breakup of Pangaea. Essentially, as Pangaea broke up, the plates that are moving apart caused a lot of volcanism, and that would have released a ton of gases into the atmosphere. Also, with continents breaking up, you start to get different populations becoming isolated, different environments start to form, and more animals die out. But Pantydraco didn't die out right away. Instead, it was still present in parts of southern Great Britain, and that's important when we're looking at what happened as this breakup occurred. Because while Europe was still somewhat in one piece, Great Britain was largely an archipelago. And eventually Europe would become an archipelago later on, but Great Britain at this time was kind of an example of what was yet to come in large parts of Europe later in the Mesozoic. Now these archipelago islands weren't necessarily super small, there would have still been pretty significant streams going through large parts of this area. And those streams obviously would have been able to support things like plant life and then sauropodomorphs like Pantydraco. And based on the teeth, Pantydraco may not have been only eating those plants, it may have actually snacked on some other things. Even Platyosaurus snacked on other things, we have one with a lizard inside of its stomach. So these animals that were not quite neosauropods yet were kind of omnivorous and that may have helped Pantydraco find success on this island. That said, the success on the island might also be part of the reason it's so small. There's a thing called insular dwarfism, which is essentially certain populations of animals get trapped on islands, and while sometimes some do become large, like some rabbits have, there's also many times where an animal gets trapped on an island and becomes much smaller. You can actually look at this in the longest snake in the world, the reticulated python which on the mainland can approach 30 feet in length. It's a massive snake. And while they don't normally get quite to 30 feet, again, very large. Meanwhile, there's some island populations that only get to about six to 10 feet. So much, much smaller. And that's just because there's fewer resources. So they shrunk down in size. And that's what it seems like kind of happened with Pantydraco and Thicodontosaurus. They were living in southern parts of Great Britain and then the oceans rushed in and they moved to higher land as you would if you can't swim and aren't adapted for living in the water. But as they moved to land, it turns out that they had to get smaller because just the islands and the environments that they had to live in were also getting smaller. And so they managed for certainly some amount of time because we found fossils of both of these. Fossilization is incredibly rare. So for an animal to actually get fossilized requires very specific conditions that, I mean, the animal needs to live for a long time 
not necessarily the individual, but the species, needs to live for a long time in order for the rare chance occurrence of it fossilizing to actually occur. Despite being in very different areas, both of them were found in these fissure fills, where essentially a stream or something else had cut into the rock, they fell in, and then later floods covered them up with mud and sand, which preserved the fossil for us, which is nice, but obviously unfortunate for them, because falling into a crack and dying doesn't sound that great. So Panty Draco is a super interesting animal, and in part because, you know, Panty, ha ha ha, but when you're looking at the Welsh language, it makes a lot of sense, so I really can't blame anyone there. But it really goes to show how very specific environments that different organisms live in can change their evolutionary trajectory by miles. I mean, when you're considering that Plateosaurus was still 9 meters long on mainland parts of Europe, but then Panty Draco is maybe 3 meters long, it highlights that difference and how animals will do what they need to to succeed under different evolutionary pressures. But unfortunately for Panty Draco, this kind of lifestyle didn't always work out, because eventually the environment changed somehow and it couldn't deal with that pressure. And that could be from a number of different things. Potentially the seas rose and they just all drown. Or maybe the seas actually just shrank away and then a migration could happen from mainland Europe into these parts of where it used to be islands. And then things like Plateosaurus, much larger sauropodomorphs, just outcompeted them because they could bully them off of food. Alternatively, maybe it's something very specific to that island. Maybe a storm killed their main source of food and just ripped up the trees or something, and then they all starved because of that. There's a lot of different possibilities as to why Panty Draco didn't succeed. But it's important to also take to note that Panty Draco was kind of a forebearer or a foreshadowing of what would come for sauropods, neosauropods even, in Europe after this time period. Because you do have things like Europosaurus from the Cretaceous, and it was also found on an environment that's thought to have been an island, because unlike its closest relatives, it's also much smaller. Now, it's not quite the same diminutive size as Panty Draco, but it, again, is doing the same kind of thing with this insular dwarfism. So all of this is just to say that Panty Draco is a great example of how evolution can take different trajectories, but at least some of the time it kind of rhymes in the similarities we see.